So how are you doing on the emotions? Are you working your way back up? Getting your hand to, around the problem? You understand the problem now? Starting to see how you might apply some of the stuff? Sure. Yeah, I see all those positive. All right, so I was supposed to be here two classes, and I'm here a third class. So what can you learn from that? Deadlines do not apply to professors. You know, when you're given a talk and you're given six minutes, and the prof if you go 6.2 minutes, you're not going to lose a letter grade. It doesn't apply to professors. We just take as much time as we want. The old saying is, what does it mean when a professor looks at his or her watch? Absolutely nothing. So we just keep going. So uh, we're going to finish up uh, the topic of reliability. So I think we finished with this. We, talked, we were talking about <coughs> keeping the equipment in the region where damage was not done to the equipment. And that isn't, that isn't always going to happen automatically. So we're going to have to maybe design the system so that it doesn't get damaged. And we looked at one example. So this is just one example where we had a compressor. The feed's coming in. It gets narrower down here as it's compressed. And out comes the, the, the product. And maybe we'll just leave it like that for now. So that would be what you would design. And that's what the way the calculations were done in the flow sheet. Now look at, but if we look over here at the, the map of the compressor, flow versus head, there's this dashed line. And to the left of the dashed line, the machine will self-destruct. It'll have positive and negative flows, flows in both directions, very, very high frequency. And in a few seconds, it'll destroy itself. So that's not good. We know that's not good. So we're going to have to make sure that we're over here in the OK region. Now, this feed rate can change. There may be some disturbance, or maybe even we just re reduce production rate. So how do we make sure that we <coughs> stay in a high flow region if this feed flow is low? Well, that's where we cleverly came up with the simple solution of having a recycle. So we're going to have a recycle stream. We're measuring this flow rate. And if it, tr it goes too low, it gets, gets, starts to get near this, we're going to have a recycle around the system. So when we calculate, let's say, energy consumption per pound of product, if we're at design, energy consumption per pound of product, if we're at design, this will be closed. So we can just calculate what, what's the cost of energy for this compressing this material through the plant. Now, if we reduce production rate, we're going to have to open this recycle. So what's going to happen is we're going to put a lot more energy into the system per pound of product than we would with when, the, when the system is uh, closed. So we need this for reliability, prevent equipment damage, absolutely. And it also is going to have an effect on our economics. Besides the capital that we put in here, we're going to have to recognize that if we're running down in a low production rate, it's going to cost us a lot more energy per pound of material being produced in the plant. So that's important. It's important that you at least understand that there's something about surge. And if you see a compressor, you need to go look a little bit more about surge. But the key thing here is not the compressor. It's that you, the lesson is you have to understand each piece of equipment and how it works. Not the way it's covered in thermodynamics or heat transfer or fluid mechanics, but how the real piece of equipment works. Because you don't see this in your fluid mechanics book or in your thermodynamics book. But so, so when you're researching the equipment that's in your plant for your project, you're going to have to look at how that actually mechanically works. And are there any situations that will cause damage to the equipment? And if there are, what do we do? 
What are the designs around it? Okay. So again, this is, remember I said we're, this course is more about structure than about calculations because you already know how to do the calculations. You know how to calculate the horsepower for the motor and you know how to actually do the economics for, for the whole system. So this is the structure, the important structure that we're adding as we go through the course. So when we see these examples, don't start saying, well, how can I possibly learn all of them? Well, you can't. You might go work in, in the pharmaceutical industry where you're making pellets and you're, you have special equipment for that and very high purity separation. You may work in the oil fields. So wherever you go, you're going to have to, through years of experience, learn this stuff. And this is a good place to start on your project. Okay. Any questions on this little example? Keep the equipment in the safe region. By the way, this, this would contribute to plant safety because these blades can come shooting through the machine at people. That's not good. Okay, so plant inventory. Plant contains lots of material. Discuss advantages and disadvantages. So some engineers and all operators love inventory. Some engineers hate inventory and all accountants hate inventory. So why would all of the people in finance hate inventory? Knowing what you do not know about cost estimating and time value of money and so forth. So what are some bad things about inventory from a financial point of view? Yes. Yeah, so all of that material you own now is not earning any money. It's, remember, we call it working capital. So we can have lots and lots of working capital, and that's bad. I mean, we don't. Financial people would say, get rid of all that. That's dead money. I can invest that somewhere. I could even put it in a bank and get some interest somewhere. Not in Canada, but someplace. So it's gonna, it, that's cost us money. What else? does it take, as far as just from a financial point of view? Yes? Okay, depending on how long you hold it, there is going to be some time value money. Uh, whether it's cheaper or not depends upon whether there's, there's a contract price and a spot price for almost everything. So the contract price is you go out and I'm going to, I'm going to buy this material over the next few years or the next few months. The spot price is, today, I need some more. How much is that going to cost? And those two can change. Right? So if you, if you contracted for cr crude oil, the, the price over the last few years has been $100 a barrel. The spot price now is 80 So actually, the spot price is lower. But you're taking a chance if you wait for the spot price. So it's either way. Yes? Yeah, you can, yeah that, and that costs a lot of money. And also land. So land space. In Canada, there's lots of land. You know. But in Singapore, there's not a lot of land. So holding uh, a large inventory there can be troublesome. All right, so, so the accountants, they hate it all the time. But everybody who runs plants loves inventory. And why would that be in general? Yes. All right, so, so if I have, I'm, I'm going to make, I don't know, 10,000 barrels a day of gasoline. If there's no inventory, then I'd have to make exactly that divided by how many minutes there are in a day every minute. Right? I'd have to have a, a constant production rate every minute. Say, so any little bobble would create a, a problem in our supply chain. But if I have inventories, then I can take some raw materials and make more diesel out of that because maybe it's more profitable with this raw material than maybe Syncrude to make diesel and then get some uh, West Texas and make uh, gasoline out of it. So there's lots more flexibility 
uh, to if you have inventory. A lot of flexibility. So operators love inventory. When you take inventory out, they're going to hate you because every disturbance anywhere in the plant propagates all the way through the plant immediately. And inventory breaks those, in, puts, breaks those interactions and makes it a lot easier to run. So there's always a conflict. And this is a, not a good slide because there are way too many words, but let's, this, there, there's some examples on that side, but let's go down the list of some of the good reasons. Okay, sometimes it's required for process performance. If you have a heat exchanger, it's got to be, and it's a liquid-liquid heat exchanger, for example, the shell and the tube have to be full of liquid. There's no way around it. It's got to work, right? Or a chemical reactor. You need a residence time in the chemical reactor. Well, you got to have some inventory. You know, even no matter what the accountants say, you know, you've got to have it. Uh, mixing. Okay, so if I have a stream with a, a variable temperature or a variable composition, and my next unit is sensitive to those disturbances, you know from process dynamics, who was taught to you by a very qualified person, that if you have a, a fluctuation coming into a tank, out of that tank is going to be a much, much smaller fluctuation. Okay? So to, if you have a disturbance coming along and you want to protect your next unit, you can put a tank in between. Same thing, flow rates and properties. Sometimes you have to have, in many cases, almost all plants, you have to have some inventory because the raw materials are not delivered continuously. The raw materials are delivered periodically. You get a rail car or you get a ship or even if you have a pipeline, the pipeline isn't continuous because the pipeline is giving product material to different plants at different times. So you have a time period in which you get your raw material, then that stuff goes down to someplace else. So the steel companies, when they get their coal, do you think they get their coal, uh, how, how do they get their coal delivered and their iron ore delivered mostly? No, bigger than that, really big, shipping, it gets shipped. So how many deliveries do they get in January? Zero. It's frozen. The lakes are frozen. So you, you're talking about big piles of inventory that they have to have. They can make up some by rail car, but they have huge inventories, big piles of coal, for example, to make the coke. All right, so periodic Feed delivery and also product dispatch. You don't always send your, you don't send your products out usually continually. You send them by rail car or by ship or whatever. So you have to have inventory. Um, you have to have uh, dump tanks or slop tanks. Something goes wrong, you need to store that material, so you need to have invent inventory for that. You have to have the tanks available so that if something goes wrong, boom, you, you put it over the side. You don't want to spill it in the river and to increase reliability, so we're going to talk about that one. Why don't you want inventory? The number one reason is hazards. If you have any material that's at all hazardous, the more of it you have, the worse off you are if something goes wrong. So, will you talk about Bhopal? So, uh, you're going to hear about Bhopal. They had a lot of methyl isocyanate, I think it was, inventory. They had a couple of plant units, and they were unreliable. So to keep the plant running, they stored this extremely hazard, hazardous material so that they could, if either one shut down, they, would, they could keep the other one running. And when that leaked, they killed at least 3,000 people. 3,000 people. There was chemists, there were processes around that would eliminate that inventory. They chose not to use that process, but to use one that required the inventory. So hazards are very bad. Product quality degradation. If you're working in a f the food industry, that's obvious. You know, bananas spoil. So there's, there's a lot of degradation in products. Or timing out of products. What good is last year's iPhone. 
to you in inventory. Not very much. So you have to keep your inventories small so you don't either have a degradation in the, the stuff itself or the products, uh, products uh, price. Space, capital costs, working capital, we talked about those. Operating costs, you may have to heat it or refrigerate it while you're storing it. If you do, then those are operating costs. And then it slows everything down. Sometimes you want to be able to push stuff through the plant fast. So look, we got a huge number of good things and a huge number of bad things. So that's great because it's, 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 it's a challenging problem and that's why engineers get paid so much money. So you're going to have to find this balance. Let's look at a couple of examples. A distillation tower. There's reflux here and there's a reboiler down here. So we have the opportunity to make that drum any size in our design. And this reboiler can be any size. So how do we choose the size? Well, let's concentrate down here because I can reach this one. So this side, see there's a little weir here, a, a little wall. So the liquid comes in and it gets boiled here and then what doesn't get boiled overflows over here, and then that gets pumped out. Okay. So this is a heat exchanger in here. So high, how high does that weir, that wall, have to be? It has to be high enough so that. Blank. What's blank? All right, talk to your friends for a second. We need an answer. That wall has to be high enough so that Okay, it has to be high enough so that what? Yeah. Okay, and how high does that liquid level have to be for the heat exchanger to work? If there were tubes above that liquid level, would it exchange any heat? No, wouldn't do any boiling. So that weir has to be high enough so that the liquid covers all of the tubes in the heat exchanger. Right? And that's mandatory. We have no option. Once we calculate the, the length of the tubes and you know, the area for the heat exchanger, that's our, our design. So this weir has to be large enough to, to cover the tubes in the heat exchanger. Right? And then it overflows. The excess that overflows is just like a little tank, it's like a little separate tank. And usually the rule of thumb is about five minutes of holdup time. Five minute hold up time is the volume divided by the design flow rate. So five minutes is about the minimum time it's going to take for a human being to recognize and react to some problem. So that there's there's a and you're going to talk about this in safety. There's a a sensor here with alarms, and if it goes too high or too low, there's an alarm, and then somebody has some time to uh, correct it. So we would never have like a 30 second hold up time. So five minutes is the lowest. So this would be about five minutes because it's a small boot and this would be five to 10 minutes for, for the reflux drum. Okay. So for the small ones, and by the way, what, what, wait a minute, wait a minute, you gotta stop me. Why do I need a reflux drum? What the heck good is this reflux drum? I've got the condenser here, and the liquid comes down, and it goes into the pump. Why do I have a drum between the condenser and the pump? It's always there, right, the answer. Well, it's always in the book. Why do we need it? Yeah, because the condenser isn't going to have an absolutely continuous stream of material. So we have to make, but the pump wants a continuous stream of liquid. So we need something in between. So the level's going to go up and down a little bit from second to second and minute to minute. But we need to make sure that we have a continual stream to this pump. 
Same thing here. That's why we have it here as well. Okay. And I think, you know, well, you have a couple distillation towers, so you're going to be involved with those kinds of issues. Okay. Any questions on that? So we have to, wherever there's a chance that there might not be a continuous stream to the pumps, you definitely want to have a small drum. And it's kind of in this 5 to 10 minute size. Now, what about, this is the biggest inventory I've ever seen. I found this on the internet. This is in the Houston Ship Canal, where there are a lot of refineries, petroleum refineries. Uh, 1.6 million cubic meters is the storage capacity. If you filled that full of oil, it would be worth $1 billion. Right? And look at, this, look at the space it's taking. Right? That's why you don't want to live on this ship canal. Nobody would live on that disgusting body of water with all the leaks. Uh, so th there's sort of the range. Oops, sorry. Five to 10 minutes through this huge amount of oil. So why do they have this? Well, you could have a storm and the ships could get delayed and you have all of these petroleum refineries running and they want to keep running. So you're going to need a lot of inventory. And it's not just one big tank, not only because of economics, but also because they're, they're different qualities of raw material. We talk about crude oil, but there's lots of different kinds of crude oil, whether it's high sulfur, low sulfur, or high bottoms, in other words, a lot of tar in it or not. So you have, to, you have to separate these different materials as well. So that's, you know, th those are the extremes. But if you drive around Hamilton and you, you, you're going to see storage tanks, you're going to see big piles of coal around the steel plants, the ones that are running. Okay. How do we use this? So let's talk about how things vary and how we're going to talk about ultimately how we size it. So we have two units. Here's a little thought exercise. Process one and process two. And we're th we have an inventory between them. Now, in this case, we're going to talk about unplanned and planned uh, disturbances. Here's a planned disturbance. So I'm going to take process one out of service for maintenance. But I want to continue to make the product from process two. What's my overall strategy? Here's my shutdown period. I'm going to shut down. Process one here. What do I do? What's my strategy for F1, F2, and this level over this entire time frame? See what's going to happen? We know what's going to happen ahead of time. So we've got lots of time. We know this is weeks ahead of time. We're going to shut this down. And we would know if it's planned because we have to hire in contractors and get everybody there working 24 hours a day for that short time when it's shut down. And so what's the, what's the strategy for F1, F2, and L? So take a minute and talk to your friends. We want to keep the product coming out of P2. <clears throat> okay, so what do we do before the, the shutdown. What are we going to do? Yes. All right, so I'm going to have F1 above the normal uh, value, its normal value, and I'm going to accumulate inventory. During the shutdown, what do I do? Yeah. Okay, I could either keep F2 constant or I could decrease it, depending upon whether I have enough inventory. Now how should, so that's, that, that, that's great. How big does that inventory have to be now? So I don't have to reduce F2. Yeah. 
Yes? Ah, exactly right, yeah. That's the minimum inventory, so we build it a little bit bigger. So, if F, F2 and F1 are the same, basically, okay? So, for this period, there's going to be zero F1. So, if I keep F2 constant, it's going to drain down. So, F2 or F1 times this period is the minimum inventory that I have to design into my plant so that I don't have to reduce F2. If I didn't make it big enough, then I'll have to reduce, reduce F2. Okay. Then when I recover, what should I do? After, right after the planned inventory, or planned shutdown. I want to build the inventory back up again a bit, so I would increase F1. Because in normal situations, I would want the inventory about in the middle. Because I don't know whether F1 or F2 is going to fail, so I'm going to keep it in the middle. But before the shutdown, I'm going to build the inventory. I shut down, the inventory drops like a rock because nothing's going in and a lot's coming out. And then I'm going to rebuild it back up to the, its, its average value again. But, you know, that tank isn't going to magically get to be the right size. That's up to us to size that. So we have to know how long are, is it going to take. It's going to take two days or three days or four hours, whatever it is. What's the shutdown length that we're going to experience every period, every six months or every year or every two years, whatever it happens to be? Dynamics. Process control, what a great course. Okay, everybody see that? So when we decide that there are going to be units that are going to be shut down separately, we, we want to have invent inventory between them so that we don't have to shut down the entire plant. Okay, here's, here's the other situation. We talked about planned shutdowns. Now I'm going to talk to you about unplanned shutdowns. So the mathematics is in the chapter, the, all the parameters you need to do the, and the equations you need to do the calculations. So we're going to talk through this qualitatively now. And then you're going to be so excited about this that you're going to run right. You're not even going to eat lunch. You're going to read the chapter right away, right? OK. It's a deal. Um, so we have the same little simple situation of two processes. Now this process over here, number two, is very reliable. 0.95 reliability. This poor process over here is really in trouble. This is as only a reliability of 0.15. God, that's terrible. We can't run that. So we want to keep our production running. So we're going to put a tank in here. Now this is the Bhopal situation, exactly. This is exactly the Bhopal situation. So if that's really hazardous material, you're, you shouldn't be putting the tank in. You should be trying to find other chemistry or changing the process so this doesn't keep failing all the time. All right? But let's assume that it, it's safe to do that. Um, now, we've got a low reliability here. So if, if I took the tank out, what would be the reliability of that system? 0 0.15 times 0.95. Okay, it's a series system. So, so I, that's pretty low. So I want to put this tank in. So that means that the, if, the, if we have a, and it, we don't know when these are going to occur. We can't build the inventory and all that stuff. So uh, how much inventory do we need here that's going to be nearly full so that we can keep this plant running while we, at any time, the shutdown occurs. Now the repair time is not known exactly. So the repair time is exponentially distributed. And so it's like a time and it goes like that. So what will the shape of the, re we have a plot here of, let's think of this as just the volume. It's the volume divided by the mean repair time. And this is the reliability of the two systems. What will the shape of this curve look like as, 
as I increase the volume, what's going to happen to the reliability of that plant? As I increase the volume. So take a minute, talk to your friends real quickly. What's the shape of that curve? You can't do the calculations in your head, but what's the shape? What are the terminal values over here and way, way out here with a huge tank? So we know the terminal value over here, that's 0 0.15 times 0 0.95, right? If it's a huge, huge tank, way out here, what's it going to be? Of the whole process. If the whole process, if the tank is enormous, 0 0.95. 0 0.95, exactly. So the shutdowns just aren't going to affect. I've got Lake Erie full of storage, then then, it's, then these shutdowns are not going to affect the process, and it's going to be 0.95. So we're going to go between 0.15 to 0.95. How, we're, how are we going to do that? By spending money, by building bigger and bigger, bigger tank. Okay? So it's going to look something like that, for example. And these will, this will be posted, if it isn't already. We'll post this, this PowerPoint. And also, it's in the chapter that we read. Uh, Okay, so we can see as we spend more and more money, first of all, we get a, a lot of bang for our buck. And then after a while, of course, when we start approaching Lake Erie, then we're spending a lot of money and we're not getting any improvement, but very insignificant improvement. So how would we decide, now you're an engineer, and uh, somebody did this calculation for you already, and you're, you, this is your first day at work, and your boss comes in and says, okay, tell me how big the tank should be. So you can't, can't work out the numbers now. What would be the analysis procedure you would use to decide how big this tank is? Cost, Cost? okay. So what, what are the, let's say, say if we take, talk about positive costs and negative costs, or let's say the costs that are negative, what, what, what would they be in this analysis? The tank, and if you had any working capital, the working capital, okay. And what would be the benefit then? Yeah. Do you have an idea? Okay, so that's right. So, so what's the cost of not being able to produce that? So you're going to trade those two off. So you're going to do an economic analysis, and it's usually called a life cycle cost analysis, LCC. And we're going to see the results of that in a second. Okay. So I'm going to skip over re reliability or maintenance. So here's life cycle cost analysis, and we're going to apply this very quickly to two systems, and then we're going to be done. So here's a, here's a, a, a spreadsheet right out of the first four weeks of the course. I think it was one of the examples. I don't, did you have those examples? Did you post those? Yeah. So, so this is, you've seen this one. So what's new? What are we adding? We're, we're using exactly the same principles. Now we're going to include maintenance costs because if I add a bunch of pumps, then I have to maintain them. Uh, the, I need to know the failure rates and the cost of failure. So I'm going to calculate my failure rates and say, well, every two years I'm going to have a failure, and if, but if I design it differently, it's a, a failure every four years. So that's going to change the, because we're going to put a cost on the failure. That's the damage to equipment, the personnel time, and the cost of lost production. Okay. Material and inventory. Okay. So we're going to add, we're going to be careful to include all of these issues into our cost analysis. So here's two little examples. The first one is pumps. 
We have pumps and series. Now this is, you can't read this thing. I mean, I get an F in my presentation. I'm sorry, but I couldn't see how to do it anyway. So I'll just talk you through the problem and the data. You, the data is there if you can read it. We have a situation in which we, we need to pump some material, and we're going to decide how many pumps we need. One, two, three, or four. Okay. Up here is the size of the pump and some information about the cost estimating. Then we have the discount rate, the interest rate, and the project life, 10 years and 12%. Um, then we have some economic data here. Oh, uh, I gotta explain that one thing. This is time, and these are dollars. You did, when you were doing your cost benefit analysis, you did everything with NPV, right? You, you, if you wanted to compare things, you compared the NPV of alternatives. And you said the one with the highest NPV is the better, the best of the, the lot. Uh, this analysis is using something slightly different. Now, because you don't understand time value of money, you realize that I could take this NPV and I could find an equivalent so out to 10 years, the e equivalent annual cost. Some people call it the equivalent annual work. So this analysis, instead of using NPV, is using equivalent annual cost or worth. Now you could do this conversion easily. So in either case, here you'd say the highest NPV wins, here you'd say the highest equivalent annual positive cost or negative worth would, would win. Okay. So that's very, the, yeah, both of these are in, in common use. So they're entirely equivalent, and you're going to come up with exactly the same answer however you do the calculations. All right, so we have the cost of the pump. We have the cost of additional engineering for each new pump that I put in from one to four. The, the preventative maintenance I have to do, the cost to repair a pump when it fails, the process cost for each failure. There's $100,000 for each failure just for process materials. And I have the pump mean failure rate, which is about 3.4 years, which is typical of the numbers that you'll see in the, in the literature. So now I, have, I can buy as many pumps as I want, and I can install them, and I've got all the costs associated with that. And then I've got all the costs associated with failures. The more pumps I get, the more reliable in parallel, so the fewer the, the failures. So here's the economic analysis down here, and it's all blurred, and you can't even see it. Why did I do that? Okay, what's the answer? Two. The equivalent annual cost is its minimum here. Okay. So it's about forty thousand, I think, twenty thirty-six thousand, forty-two thousand. So what that is saying is, in this situation, I want to put two pumps in parallel, in standby. So this is how you could do an economic analysis of, the, of a reliability problem. OK, questions? Yes? Well, no, you probably do it over the lifetime of the pump. Oh. So 10 years is, you know, if, it, if it's got a breakdown time of, of 3.5, then maybe three breakdowns or something before you replace the pump. And then, and then assuming, remember, that it's a, a totally reproducible <clears throat> for the next 10 years or the next 10 years. Okay. Yes? <clears throat> that would be the, the pump is leaking and you have to stop it and repair it. So it's not a total replacement. Yeah. We hope. But you know, that's, that's the planning basis for it. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so this is the, you know, I think, you know, from the economics you can see that this, this can be done if you get the data. So the, the, basically the thing is get that extra data, the, the, the mean uh, failure rates. Uh, okay, so here's our inventory problem again. And we already talked about, we actually talked about this, so I'm just going to show you the answer. So the data is in the chapter, but here's that inventory problem with low reliability, 0.15, and high reliability, how big should that tank be? And so we see here we're, start, we're, we're reducing the product losses, so that's very, very good. And then over here, now we're, we're, we're increasing the, the capital costs for the tank far too much. So there's this break-even point in the middle, so we've got the optimal, uh, the optimal uh, design of, of the tank. Now again, you have to have information about reliability of, these equi of the equipment before you can do the sizing. Okay, and those, those are, the details are in the book, but I'm not going to, you know, go through spreadsheets here. They're impossible to teach. You just got to sit there and read them. All right, so we're, we're talking about a, a balance in the costs when there's no safety involved. When there's safety issues involved, then we set a safety standard and we spend any amount of money to get to that safety standard. When hazards are not present, then we have a balance. We can break things and, you know, and fix them as long as nobody gets hurt. Now, now we have the economic balance. But I'll guarantee you the plant will not run well if you just get cheap when you do the design. So if you say, well, I'm not going to put any spare pumps, and I don't want tanks, and I don't want this, and that, then that plant isn't going to run. People are going to hate you. If, don't ever visit a plant if you design it that way. OK? So that's our introduction to reliability. We're going to, here's some words you probably haven't heard in Ming Master ever. We're going to end this class early. We always do that once a year, just so you, can never, you can't say that we never ended a class early. <laughs> and now you owe uh, some time to Professor Dunn in the other classes. OK, so take this into consideration while you're doing your project. Every project is going to have to address reliability specifically. You're going to have to have a section in your report on reliability. What decisions inf were influenced by reliability? Thank you.